Thank the Surface Navy uh, Association. I am member 484. I'm proud to be a life member of this organization. Uh, you do so much uh, for the Surface Navy and the United States Navy. Uh, it is a selfless job that Bill Erickson and his team does. So, and Pete, thanks so much for all you do. America has many enduring strengths, but one of those strengths is the United States Navy. What we do is hard, and there's no getting around that. If it were easy, uh, it wouldn't be worth doing anyway. Everything from conceptualizing our ships to constructing them, to manning them, to training their crews, to funding them, and finally, to operating them forward in support of national objectives, these are all challenging tasks. They challenge us, and in turn, they challenge our families. And I want to take a moment to express my gratitude to our Navy families for joining in that work. And in light of recent events in the Middle East, and the amount of time I spent on the phone with Jim Malloy, we can never forget that we often have families serving forward with our sailors. And we must keep them and their safety and our gratitude for their sacrifice at the forefront of our minds. But the reason our hard work and the sacrifices that our Navy make, that our families make, excuse me, are so worthwhile is this. Decisive naval power is absolutely essential to maintaining the way of life we enjoy in this room and across this country. Many people have said that the national defense strategy is essentially a maritime strategy, including the acting Secretary of Defense, Tom Modley, most, re most recently in his latest uh, Vector 6. I believe that too. And for those of us who have spent our lives at sea, we innately know the reasons why. The rest of America, as I've said, however, may not know. And we, collectively, owe it to ourselves and our country to do a better job of making that case for what the United States Navy does for our fellow citizens. There are so many ways that our work is critical, but there are three in particular that I want to touch on this afternoon. The first is securing that economic prosperity that we all enjoy. The second is deterring our adversaries. And if we must fight, keeping that fight far, far from home. And the third is providing flexible options to our civilian leaders in any corner of the world. And as CNO Clark would say, without a permission slip. First, we secure America's economic prosperity, which was the primary concept that led to the founding of our Navy. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 24 said, if we mean to be a commercial people, we must endeavor as soon as possible to have a Navy. What was true at the founding of our nation still rings true today. America's economy is more connected to the sea than at any point in our history, in our, Navy, in our Navy, and you stand ready to protect those connections. You know the statistics, 90% of the trade volume, 99% of the digital data traveling over those transoceanic cables, 70% of the people living within 100 miles of the coast. Those statistics are rising still. American commerce is maritime commerce. The American economy floats on seawater. But more importantly, those of you who have been at sea recently have seen these changes in front of your very eyes. For Captain Sethi, who sailed in the Baltic, you've seen the massive installation of offshore wind energy. Turbines equivalent to 26 standard power plants were installed in 2018 alone. It was also the first year that China led the world in offshore wind construction. If you sailed in the Arabian Gulf, You've passed desalinization plants, of which there are 20,000 around the world, providing fresh water to more than 300 million people. The vast majority of these have been built in the last three decades. If you've sailed the Bismarck Sea by Papua New Guinea, you've seen ships engaged in the new global gold rush of deep sea mining, working to extract not only gold, but precious metals critical for advanced technologies. And if you've pulled into ports around the world, you will see new infrastructure. Infrastructure funded in part by the direction of the Chinese government. More than just infrastructure, the Chinese government is growing a network 
of influence, which helps them exert control over an international system that we're trying to protect, allowing them to have more coercive power, as described in a recent article in The New Yorker, to determine which features of the global status quo to preserve and which to reject. China and other nations are increasingly aware of the scale and the scope of our interdependence on the seas, combined with complexity arising from their increased use and that our economy is more sensitive to disruptions in the maritime environment. We will not allow it to be disrupted. The National Defense Strategy acknowledges its sen this sensitivity, stating, the failure to meet our defense objectives will result in reduced access to markets that will contribute to a decline in our prosperity and our standard of living. Another timeless role we fulfill by virtue of our mobility and scalability is providing our civilian leaders an adaptable range of foreign policy options. And in this age of great power competition, the key thing we provide our leadership and our country is deterrence. The concept of competition can be distorted to imply that conflict is an inevitable thing, but I don't believe that. But we must have credible capabilities and demonstrate the will to use them to deter and win without fighting. As President Teddy Roosevelt stated, a good Navy is the surest guarantor of peace. Finally, if deterrence fails, naval power allows the United States of America to fight, to keep and fight forward, far away from our shores. This task has become more demanding today. It demands developing concepts and capabilities that prevent the erosion of our defensive margin and preserves the commons. Admiral Kilby, are you feeling the pressure? In 1954, Samuel Huntington said in a proceedings article called National Policy in the Transoceanic Navy that the locale of divisive action has switched to the coastal area to what various writers have described as the Rimland, the periphery, or the littoral. He also said that dispersion, flexibility, and mobility, not concentration, are the basic tactical doctrines of our Navy. There are a lot in these words that still apply today and will inform our future capabilities and our operating concepts. Our efforts are focused on preserving advantages while expanding others especially in regards to dispersion, flexibility, lethality, and mobility. These traits allow us to effectively and credibly compete for control of contested maritime spaces. These traits allow us to keep the location of decisive action well away from the homeland. One need, no, one need look no further than the headlines of the past week to see why these roles matter securing commerce through critical choke points, providing foreign policy options for our leaders, and keeping the danger away from the United States. And we know the Truman Carrier Strike Group, including the incredibly capable surface ships, Lass and Farragut, Forrest Sherman, and Normandy, operating forward today, right now, demonstrate our national resolve. They need no permissions to operate where they are, and they are sustainable, they are lethal, and they are survivable. Carrier strike groups, amphibious readiness groups, our submarines, our aircraft in the air, continue to deter actions at sea and above that would be detrimental to American security and to the rules-based international order. We've been thinking about what we provide the American people but let's shift very briefly to what we're doing to ensure that we can continue to provide these benefits. I recently released my initial guidance to perform the roles we just discussed and to compete in the strategic environment that we live in. That guidance articulates three areas of focus, war fighting, war fighters, and future Navy. WWF, I couldn't come up with a third W. <laughs> for, uh, nobody helped me. We've discussed how many of our core functions happen every day. They are not reserved for a hypothetical, decisive battle. A focus on warfighting is critical 
because ready and lethal forces are critical in day-to-day -day competition. Mission one for every sailor is a ready Navy, a Navy ready to fight today. That readiness translates into deterrence, into economic security, and preserves our defensive margin. That's why we're taking a hard look at things like ship depot level maintenance and the modernization of our force, as well as how we generate forces to employ them forward. That gives us increased operational availability to our combatant commanders. A focus on warfighting also acknowledges that our capital investments are long term. Between now and 2030, the vast majority of our force structure will consist of the fleet that we sail with today. Despite the tendency here in DC to focus on some false choices, the truth is that in order to deter our challenges in the future, we have to grow our fleet's capabilities at the same time that we maintain and modernize. It's our job to argue for that growth. It's why we need a Navy. The truth is, if we aren't growing those capabilities today, we are falling behind. The growth I'm talking about is a lot more than numbers. Growth is about increasing our naval relationships, first and foremost, with the United States Marine Corps, as well as with the Joint Force and with our allies and partners. Growth is about increasing our understanding of what the nature of global competition is for Americans and what it means to their economic security, our political security, and our very way of life. Finally, our growth in warfighting is focused on integrated American naval power, what the Navy and the United States Marine Corps provide the nation together. We're fortunate that the Commandant will be able to address this audience tomorrow so that you can hear his thoughts. We're moving out together, side by side, integrating much more closely than we have in recent years, and that's, a, that's very much a credit to his leadership. Are there any Marines in the room? Tracy, I don't know if you got my memo, but I'm now calling 3MEF 8th Fleet. <laughs> Admiral Aquilino's very excited. A focus on warfighters acknowledges our sailors remain a real asymmetric advantage. While we're working hard to reform our personnel system to offer more flexibility in a naval career and to reduce the bureaucracy involved in the frequent moves associated with naval service. We're emphasizing education as the Secretary's education for sea power efforts bear fruit, as well as ready, relevant learning to get training to our sailors faster and at the waterfront where it matters the most. Our investments that we, that we are making and that I will continue to make in live virtual and constructive training will allow crews at all stages of force generation to participate in realistic high-end training. And we're invigorating our culture with a focus on excellence, not just avoiding what is wrong, not just complying, but actively pursuing what is right. In terms of the future Navy, we're, con we're concluding an integrated naval force structure assessment this week. We tend to get in absorbed in the details, but today I'll say that there's broad agreement across the government that our Navy needs to grow. We need to pursue unmanned technologies and we need to solve tough technology and policy issues associated with unmanned instead of running away from them. We need to ensure that our logistics forces can support a larger fleet and that they can do so in support of distributed maritime operations in contested environments. As surface warriors, we can be very excited about what some of our near-term efforts are. The next generation frigate experimenting with unmanned and optimally manned systems in concert with manned platforms by continuing to backfit our current ships with new capabilities the deployment of Gabriel Giffords to 7th Fleet with the Naval Strike Missile, a prime example. In my entire career, and I say this not just because I'm CNO, I really believe I can't think of a better time to serve in the United States Navy and in our surface force. Decisive and growing naval capability has never mattered so much to our way of life. It's up to each of us to help to tell the story why. Thanks again for your welcome today. 
I look forward to your questions.